Good morning. Good morning. We are so thrilled that you have joined us for worship here at Woodbury Church of the Brethren. Thank you for coming out. I uh, just have a couple announcements. Um, we are doing a kind of combined Sunday school this morning, uh, going over the compelling vision process, um, which will be taught by our intrepid leader, Pastor David, over there. And uh, I also was asked to announce that sign-ups for the Easter tulips and the Gideon Bibles um, are out there in the narthex. They're in the little kitchenette area, um, so you can sign up for those, and you can um, either give memory of or honor of and fill on that as well. All right. So, our preparation thought this morning comes from Mark 12, 33. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. Will you pray with me? God, we come before you now, and we just acknowledge uh, that you're already here, God. Um, I just pray that you would kind of clear away any distractions that we have, God, any thoughts, any burdens that we were carrying in with us, God, and that we would be able to focus on you. God, that we would could tune in to what you would have to say to us, God. I pray that you would be lifted up by the worship we bring you today. In Jesus' name, amen. So I invite you to think about the words as you listen to the music of Come, We That Love the Lord. special time in our family. It is grandma birthday time. So um, my grandma Florence, she is my dad's mom, turned 26 a couple weeks ago. Crazy, only a year older than me. And then my grandma in heaven, Mary Clapper, my mom's mom, is the today is her birthday. So they both love the hymn in the garden and that is what we're going to sing for you guys in honor of them. Oh. 
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you, Dave. What an awesome morning we have this morning. Saw somewhere they were talking about some days in the mid '60s. I'm sure we could all could all use those coming up here. So that's good. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, um, thank you for this morning. Thank you for meeting here with us. And I just um, pray as we continue to look into your word this morning that your spirit would continue to work and move, that this would, these would not just simply be my words coming off a, a sheet of paper, but that your Holy Spirit would take them and speak them into our hearts, Heavenly Father, uh, and build us up and draw us close to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In an article called Super Spectators, USA Today, uh, writers asked sports fanatics to describe the lengths to which they would go to support their various teams. One category of sports fanatics is referred to as the frequent flyer. And here are a few examples. Eight times a season, Gio Verna takes the 5,000 mile trip from Philadelphia to Seattle to watch his beloved Seahawks play at Quest Field. Frank Weishaupt has been a Jet season ticket holder since he was 19. For each home game, he flies out of San Francisco to Boston and drives the last three and a half hours to New York. And Lou Rossi leaves New Jersey on Friday night and takes a vacation day on Mondays to make every Dallas Cowboys home game. The truck driver admits a the $500 a pop weekends are barely affordable. Says Rossi, I started when I was single. I got married. I still continued it. Now I'm divorced. <laughs> Go figure. It survived through all that, and I managed to find the money and the time to go. Sold out people will do just about anything for what it is they value. This morning we're continuing our series of lessons on preparing our hearts for the resurrection. 
And the message for this morning is loving extravagantly. It gets closely related to last week's message on pouring out our worship. Loving extravagantly. It's difficult to find love in, in the last week of Jesus' life. Examples, much less examples of extravagant love. You'll find confrontation between Jewish the, Jesus and the religious leaders. You'll find attempts to trap him in his words and discredit him. You'll find an expanding plot against his life. You'll find betrayal by, G, by Judas, abandonment by disciples who are dazed and confused, but you will find very little love. This morning, I want to point at, to Jesus' own words and three poignant examples of extravagant love from the last week of Jesus' life. We start with Jesus' words in answer to yet another question from one of the religious leaders. Which is the greatest commandment? And Jesus' words are, are nothing new. He begins with words that are very familiar to every practicing Jew, recited in most homes on a daily basis. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, and with all your strength. He links that command with a second one that also should have been very familiar. Love your neighbor as yourself. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus adds, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. If we could truly carry out these two commands, we would need no others. So this is a good place to start in our discussion of loving God extravagantly. The first part of this command is to love the Lord with all your heart. Just a, a few weeks ago was Valentine's Day. And, and, and we talked about love and we put hearts on everything and it's all warm and fuzzy. We have little cupids shooting arrows at people's hearts causing them to fall in love. An arrow through the heart will not cause you to fall in love. It will end your life. Of course, I could be sarcastic and suggest that it's pretty much the same thing either way, but I won't go. <laughs> Loving God with all your heart does not involve this kind of sentimentality. To the Jews, the heart was more than just the seat of feeling and emotions. It was the center of the inmost being, where passions form, where decisions are made, where commitments take root. It's where we decide for or against God. And that commitment flows out into the rest of our lives. We can say what we like with our mouths, but our actions reveal the truth of what's in our hearts. Likewise, we're told to love the Lord with all our soul. The soul has been described as the motivating power that brings strength of will. It's that part of our being that drives us forward along with the heart. It determines our conduct and our character. If we don't love God with all of our soul, we may lack the inner strength to live out the commitment that we've made in our heart when times get tough and things get difficult. We're also told to love the Lord with all of our mind. That means all of our mental faculties, our, all our intelligence, our ability to learn and reason. Those things need to be committed to Him. When we commit our lives to Jesus, we don't put reason and learning behind us. When we come into the church, we don't check our intelligence at the door. Rather, we use these gifts that God has given us to serve Him. When, I, when we were still living in Lebanon County, I saw an article in the local paper about an Anvil Cleona High School teacher who had issued a challenge to any evolutionist who would like to debate him. He put up $1,000 to say that he could convince a debate jury that evolution is false. As I read through the article, I was disappointed to see that he wasn't coming from any faith perspective. He was only interested in science. But it strikes me that if we as Christians are to have a voice in debates such as these, we must be intelligent and, and educated. If we can simply be discussed as ignorant and unreasoning, we won't speak well for our faith. 
We need to love the Lord with our mind. And the last part of this greatest commandment is to love the Lord with all of your strength. The word strength implies physical resources. That would include not only the physical capabilities of our body, that would also include our material possessions. All that we are and have in the physical realm should be devoted in love to God. Of course, Jesus is not done. He links this all-consuming love for God with loving your neighbor as yourself. Scripture is very clear, and we've talked about this several times recently. If we truly love God, it will and it must flow over into our relationship with others. If we say we love God and, and hate a brother or sister, we're liars. If we, can't lo if we can't love an unseen God, we can't love an unseen God if we don't love the coworker, the classmate, the neighbor, the teacher, the coach, the student that we see on a daily basis, and especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. In his book, Sources of Strength, President Jimmy Carter shared this lesson. After a personal witnessing experience with Elroy Cruz, an admirable Cuban pastor who had surprising rapport with very poor immigrants from Puerto Rico, I asked him for the secret of his success. He was modest and embarrassed, yet he finally said, Senior Jimmy, we only need to have two loves in our lives, for God and for the person who happens to be in front of us at any time. That simple yet profound theology has been a great help to me in understanding the scriptures. In essence, the whole Bible is an explanation of those two loves. Very, very, very much a truth there. Whatever the motive of this teacher of the law had been in asking this question, he recognizes that Jesus' answer is true and right. He commends Jesus. Well said, teacher. It may seem a, a bit arrogant to commend the Son of God. Jesus certainly didn't need this man's acknowledgement or, or confirmation that his answer was correct. But Jesus' response was, you are not far from the kingdom of God. This teacher, in his wise understanding, was not far from the kingdom, and yet he was not yet in the kingdom. It requires more than just understanding and acknowledging God's word. It requires putting it into practice in our lives. It requires more than just agreeing that loving God and our neighbor is the key to all the law and the scripture. It requires living out that love on a daily basis. Let's look at some examples. First, the love that gives extravagantly. I'm going to read from Mark 14, verses 3 to 9. Mark 14, verses 3 through 9. I solved that problem of the biblical text being a lot smaller than my notes. I just put it in my notes, so it's the same size. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will have always have with you. And you can help them anytime you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. I tell you the truth. Wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. It's interesting that this example of extravagant love is sandwiched between the scheming of the religious leaders on how they might kill Jesus and Judas's decision to betray him for money. What a contrast. John chapter 12 identifies this woman as Mary the sister of Lazarus. Some writers suggest that she knew Jesus was the Messiah and was anointing him in the hope that this was the time for God to, to step in and restore the kingdom of Israel. Others suggest that she knew Jesus was about to die and fully intended this as preparation for that event. 
Well, Jesus clearly understood and had communicated that. There's little reason to believe that this was Mary's intent. Mary's motivation seems to be simply to do something out of a great love for her Lord. Mary is an example of loving at great cost. Loving at great cost. The jar of perfume was very expensive. The men around her quickly pegged its value at 300 denarii, or almost a year's wages. And they lamented the waste of money that could have been given to the poor or perhaps skimmed off into their own pockets. Did Mary know exactly how much it was worth? I'm sure she knew it was expensive. She probably hadn't had it appraised so she could deduct it on her income tax return as a charitable contribution. I think she felt that nothing was too good, nothing was too costly to demonstrate her love for Jesus. Was this a waste? I don't, I don't think so. Would you give up a year's worth of anything that you love for God? You know how much you make in a year and, and how hard you work for it. Would you give that amount away to build God's kingdom? Would you give up a, a year of your time to some special ministry to which God was calling you? Would you give up a year's worth of vacation time to go do a mission project? Would you give up a year's worth of your favorite TV show to teach a Sunday school class, or, or lead a Bible study? Or is that kind of love a little too extravagant for you and for I? This account is also an example of loving without regard to your own reputation. John's account indicates that Mary not only poured this expensive perfume on Jesus' head, but perhaps his feet, and she also wiped his feet with her hair. How humbling, how degrading, how self-deprecating. That weren't enough. Her actions were greeted with criticism. The men rebuked her harshly. But Mary didn't care about her reputation. She didn't care about what others thought or said. She was there for one purpose, to demonstrate her love for Jesus. She was willing to, to humble herself. She didn't feel degraded. After all, this was her Lord and Savior. If this had been an ordinary man, if this had been an attempt to gain his, his love and favor, it would have been terribly degraded. But as an act of love, a service to God, it wasn't degrading at all. Is my love, is your love extravagant enough to disregard the opinions and the criticism of the world and focus only on serving Jesus. That is the love that pleases our Savior. Jesus came to Mary's defense. You, know, you can and should help the poor anytime you have an opportunity to. But she's done a beautiful thing for me. She has anointed my body for burial. Remember, this was the only anointing of Jesus' body that occurred. The, the women went to the tomb on the first day of the week to do so, but it was too late. Jesus continues, the gospel will be shared throughout the world and everywhere it goes, she will be remembered. Mary's simple outpouring of extravagant love was, was far more significant and, and more far-reaching than she ever imagined. Because this is the kind of love that pleases our Savior. Our second example is a love that gives everything. This comes from Mark 12, 41 through 44, the, the account of the, the widow's offering. I'll read this as well. Mark 12, 41 through 44. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put. And watch the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They have, get, they have given out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything. All that she had to live on. 
David Garland in the, in the NIV application commentary, indicates that there were 12, 12 trumpet-shaped collection boxes that stood around in, in the court of the, of the women in the temple. And as rich folks threw their handfuls of, of silver and gold coins into these large metal boxes, their actions were announced by a loud clanging in that trumpet bell. When this widow threw in her two copper coins, the sound would have been much different, barely audible in comparison. Her coins were too Greek lepta, the smallest of the Greek coins, with the least value of any coin in circulation in Jesus' day. No one else would have taken notice, but Jesus did. Jesus saw the sacrificial devotion. As small as it was, she put in everything she had to live in. In the New Testament, Paul told his readers to give as the Lord has prospered you. But this widow went far beyond that kind of giving. It, it would seem almost as if the Lord had not prospered her at all. Who would blame her if she came into the temple with nothing, perhaps even seeking financial assistance for her needs? But she was obviously more concerned about loving and caring and serving and giving to God than she was about receiving benefits back. So she put in everything she had. Jesus' response to her gift makes it clear. It's not about what we give, but what we have left after we give. Apply that to your own way of life. Think of the way most of the people in the world live outside of our very wealthy country. And ask yourself whether you have ever really sacrificed anything of importance to give to the cause of Christ. What necessity have you ever been deprived of because of what you gave to God? For the most part, we have much more left after we've given our offerings than most of the people in the world ever dream of having to begin with. In 2005, Thomas Cannon died of colon cancer in a hospital in Richmond, Virginia. He was 79 and described himself as a poor man's philanthropist. He never made more than $25,000 a year. He and his wife lived in poverty. Yet over the course of 33 years, he gave away more than $156,000, mainly in the form of $1,000 checks given to people he read about in the newspaper who were going through hard times or who especially exemplified courage or kindness, a youth worker in a low-income apartment complex, a volunteer faithfully serving in an elementary school, and a teenager abandoned as an infant were some of the recipients of his gifts. His motivation came from an incident that happened as a young man while away at Naval Signal School when an explosion in Chicago's port took the lives of many of his shipmates. Thomas concluded that he had been spared to help others and be a role model. And this led to a passion for giving. His biographer comments, not many people would consider living in a house in a poor neighborhood without central heat, air conditioning, or a telephone, and working overtime so they could save money to give away. That's extravagant love. This kind of love, this kind of giving, requires a radical trust. How, how would this widow survive? Where would her next meal come from? That wasn't her concern. Apparently, she had a complete trust that God could provide for her needs, even if she tossed her last two coins into that collection box. Perhaps she knew of the story of the widow of Zarephath from 1 Kings 17, where another poor widow used the last of her oil and flour to feed the Lord's prophet Elijah. And as a result... God never allowed her jar of flour to be used up or her mug of oil to run dry. The last example is the extravagant love that demands a response. And our example here is Jesus himself dying on the cross for our sins. It's that love that brought Jesus from heaven to earth and ultimately to the cross 
And it's that love that motivates our love for him and for others. This love was a humbling love. If you think it was humbling or degrading for Mary to wipe Jesus' feet with her hair, consider this. Jesus left the riches of heaven to be born in a stable. The ruler of the universe became obedient to human parents and laws. The one who established the nation of Israel as a nation unto himself was rejected by his own people. The righteous judge submitted to the judgment of evil men. The almighty God was tortured and put to death on a cross in apparent helplessness. The creator of the universe allowed himself to be put to death by his own creation. That is humbling. That is degrading. It amazes me that there are some who would claim this is a made-up story. No one would ever make up a story like this. It would be completely unbelievable. Everyone knows that a God doesn't act like this. Except that the one true God did. Second, it was a costly love. It wasn't, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> it wasn't a jar that was broken beyond repair. It was the body of Jesus. His body was tortured and ripped open, left to die on a cross, and buried in a borrowed tomb. It was an expensive perfume that was poured out for one man. It was the precious blood of Jesus that was poured out in the place of scurvy, along the path to Golgotha, and on the stained ground at the foot of the cross. And it was poured out for the sins of the world. Was that extravagant? Yes. Was it a waste? Not if we acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior and allow that precious blood to be the payment for our sins. Finally, it was a love that gave everything. Jesus held nothing back. He gave it all. He laid down his life for us in obedience to his Father. How have you responded to that love? Have you claimed Jesus as your Lord and Savior? So that his extravagant gift of love for you will not be a waste. Have you allowed that love to flood, flood your heart and soul? Does it spill over into your love for others? Is it reflected back in love and devotion to your Heavenly Father? Are you loving extravagant? Are you loving extravagant? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love for us. Love that caused you to pay such an incredible price to give all that you had for us. May our love for you reflect back that same devotion, that same sold out nature, People will do amazing things when they're sold out. May we be sold out to you. In Jesus' name. I invite you to think on the words of the familiar hymn. My Jesus, I love you. And I hope they are the prayer of your heart.
May the Lord make your love increase and overflow. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our Lord and Father, whom our Lord Jesus, when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones.